This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. Where there's a will, there's a way, <laughs> which is why we have today as our guest, Mr. Will Gisi. Gisi, that's right. Gisi, yeah. yep. Lithuanian. Who is, he has three separate titles at his advanced age. One is somewhere right up there with the Sierra Club. Another is with the Hawaii Solar Energy Association. And another is with the Inter Island Solar, Inter -Island Supply. Solar Supply, which is the solar wholesaler. When the solar installers are ready to do a job, they'll call up Inter Island Solar Supply. I need this, 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 and this. It gets all ready. They pick up their, they pull by their trucks, pick up the stuff, and move on. Yep, so yep. it's the solar heart of America. I speak without prejudice because I'm a friend of uh, Kali Judd who founded it. Yes, he did. Yeah, yeah he also mm -hmm. uh, helped found the Hawaii Solar Energy Association mm -hmm. that I work with. So welcome, uh, Will. And we are, as the audience is gathering, going to talk about solar energy today. And before we leap into the hot topic of PVs or photovoltaics, here's a lead-off question. Since the photovoltaic rooftop situation is so muddled today, and a lot of solar companies are not doing well at all because of that, why isn't everyone back on the solar water heating bandwagon? And I'll tell you my personal prejudice. I work for the state government. Our mission is 100% clean electrical energy by 2045. And we have that evening peak demand to deal with. Whoops, earpiece problem here. Why not push the heck out of solar water heating during this lull in PV? Because number one, it's a really easy sell. You get 35% state tax credit, 30% federal tax credit, and I believe it's a $750 rebate from Hawaii Energy. It's just about free, tremendous payback. And from our standpoint, when families come home around five in the afternoon, They've got a battery waiting for them in the form of 80 gallons of very hot water. Out of all the demand that they put on their homes, there is zero for hot water because they've got all the hot water they need. Therefore, that evening, nasty old evening peak gets shaved. So why not push the heck out of it? Well, it's a good question, right? So, I mean, first, I just want to say you make a lot of good points. Um, I think the rebate is actually at five hundred dollars for Hawaii oh, Energy. Okay. So, which is kind of sad, right? Because the rebates themselves, or the budget that Hawaii Energy has been allocated, keeps going down every year, which is unfortunate mm -hmm. because I think they do a lot of good work. Because mm -hmm. I like to say, you know, energy efficiency is the other side of the coin, right? Because you have mm -hmm. energy generation, which is kind of the mm -hmm. hot topic now. Oh yeah. I can have a PV system on my house. But the other side of it is efficiency, right? If I lower the load that I have to serve with my generator, the mm -hmm. generator itself doesn't mm -hmm. have to be as big. So you bring up some good points. I would say that, yeah, the, the industry right now, uh, as far as PV is going, is definitely in flux. And so mm -hmm. why isn't there an uptake in uh, more solar hot water systems in the state? Part of that is, you know, if I could speculate, I think there, you have seen an increase in some of the permits for solar hot waters in the last couple of years mm -hmm. since October. Of now, now, there's another reason you sometimes get tangled up with the PV permits, or certainly these days you get all tangled up with it. I, the solar water heating permitting process, as I understand it, is completely electronic. If yeah. you're not in a flood zone or have no other complications, boom. Yeah, you can Your get it online and just uh, like goes through just like that. Yeah. Yeah, so it's really easy to get those permits and, mm -hmm. and definitely there's been although recently, you know, the HSCA and other organizations have had a lot of success with the permitting department as far as PV systems go, mm -hmm. especially with energy storage. Um, but until recently, you know, it's been difficult to get those those energy storage permits and so mm -hmm. solar hot water obviously is a way that you can kind of remedy that, right? By mm -hmm. by lowering your load. I would say that you know there's several companies that the Hawaii Solar Energy Association, um, who are members of the HSEA, who have kind of gone back to mm -hmm. their backbone, right, of yeah, solar hot yeah, water. Yeah. But I would say that too, you know, we've had a solar PV boom, and the mm -hmm. companies that started working a lot in solar PV 
just had never done solar hot water. Good point. It's a whole different animal, yeah. and now you're dealing with all this water business, yeah. and you have to have plumbing expertise. I think a plumber has to uh, sign off on the job. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you have to yeah. have yeah. a plumbing mm -hmm. license, right? Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's two different licenses, right? Mm -hmm. You have electrical mm -hmm. and you have plumbing. So you have a big company, you know, like one of the big solar companies. They probably don't do solar hot, like a national solar company, they probably don't do solar mm -hmm. hot water. Good point, good right? point, yeah. And so they're just not diversified in that way. Mm -hmm. But thankfully to those companies, you know, they have the capital to kind of wait it out until the tariff gets better, or until mm -hmm. the solar market starts mm -hmm. picking mm -hmm. up. The unfortunate thing is that a lot of local businesses, the smaller ones that just did PV and aren't as diversified anymore because they can't do solar hot water, they kind mm -hmm. of, unfortunately, yeah. they had to cut staff, you know, yeah. and we've, we've seen a pretty significant amount of companies uh, who've lost a lot of staff. I think mm -hmm. our most recent mm -hmm. HSE report had, I don't know, maybe 50% mm -hmm. of staff yes. losses in the yes, ones that yes, we've surveyed. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, we say, wow, that's a lot, but I mean, these are people's jobs, mm -hmm. you know, that they're losing. And um, yeah, I'd, I'd like, I think there's been a slight uptake in solar hot water. Obviously, solar hot water, like I mentioned, and like my boss, Rick Reed, says, it's the backbone mm -hmm, of the solar industry. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't change very much, so it's, it's not like in flux like yeah, solar PV yeah. is. So I would like to see more companies move that way. Mm -hmm. The problem is they just have to be diversified in that way, mm -hmm. and some of them are just not set up for it. Good but the ones that are, I think, yeah. are pivoting. You know, mm -hmm. to make that in the meantime. Well, well, glad to hear it. That yeah. warms the cockles of my heart again from the <laughs> standpoint of uh, evening uh, peak shaving. Yeah, and you're totally right. You know, why buy, you know, why buy, uh, I mean, energy storage technology like lithium ion batteries are great, mm -hmm. right? But you have a battery in solar hot water, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That hot water itself is your battery. Yeah. And it, there's no danger of it catching on fire. No, or exactly. Or exploding or anything like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I mean, you've got the battery right there and it's, you mm -hmm. know, $2,000 to $2,500 after taxes and rebates. Mm -hmm. And the return on investment on that is is so great. Why wouldn't you do it, yeah. I think? Yeah. You know, if I had a house, I'd, be, I'd, better, I'd definitely be thinking about, you know, the first changes that I would make to my house. Mm -hmm. Solar hot water would be up there for sure. Yeah. And energy efficiency measures. Mm -hmm. And then like later when I, you know, have a little bit more capital or I'm a little bit better to afford a solar PV system, then I'll build that PV system, but it's gonna be smaller, right? Because mm -hmm. I've gotten rid of all that load, yeah. which is great. Yeah, back in the old days of pre any of this, right, because that's how far back I go, we would look at the energy use profile of a typical Hawaii home, which number one did not have air conditioning, Number two had the electric resistance water heater. That water heater accounted for 40% of the entire load. It still does, Howard, yeah. in some houses, 40 yeah. to 60%. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, 60% when you have a lot of people under the roof. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of dishes to wash, a lot of clothes to wash, a lot of people taking showers. Yeah, so imagine, yeah. I mean, yeah. translate that into the amount of money that you're saving every, mm -hmm. I mean, it just mm -hmm. kind of makes sense. To me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I would encourage solar installers and contractors who are able to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, to continue trying to diversify their business, build out solar hot water. And we have, you know, unlike most states in the United States, we have a pretty robust solar hot water uh, contractor installer mm -hmm. economy here. Mm -hmm. You know, I, it's, I think, you know, if you live in a state like, you know, I'm originally from Arkansas, where uh, natural gas is pretty cheap. Yep. Why would you buy a solar hot water heater when natural mm -hmm. gas is cheap? Mm -hmm. But here, we don't have natural gas, but what yeah. we do have is the sun and an mm -hmm. abundant resource. Mm -hmm. So why not just use yeah. that? And we, uh, on the, in the mainland states where it freezes in the winter, you have to have a special anti-freezing provision up there. Too. Yeah, you yeah. do not have that problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is possible to do it. I, mm -hmm. I just, my dad actually, who lives in Madison, Wisconsin, installed a solar mm -hmm. water, hot water heater. But yeah, it's a little bit more expensive, right? Because mm -hmm. you have to have that kind of freon almost in there to mm -hmm. prevent it from, from freezing. Yeah, not here. Well, I guess unless <laughs> unless you live like on top of a uh, big island or something. Okay. Like that. Well, I can assure you that on top <laughs> of the big island, they're <laughs> the only warm bodies up there. Number one are not so warm because they're astronomers. Yes. Yeah. Those astronauts that just came out of that. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. This yeah, morning. Yeah. Anyway. So you mentioned twice the word. Storage, and we're not talking now about hot water storage. You're talking about another kind of storage. What right. might that be? Right. So, kind of the hot thing right now, obviously, mm -hmm. is energy storage in the form mm -hmm. of batteries. Mostly, mm -hmm. I think, probably most popularly, lithium ion. I think the most popular mm -hmm. uh, manufacturer, obviously, is Tesla. But we have many mm -hmm. different lithium ion batteries um, that many different manufacturers, like LG Chem, Enphase, Simplify, they all kind of 
developed a lithium ion battery. And so I think this is kind of the, the PUC itself in 2015 in October made a decision to end the NEM tariff, the net mm -hmm. energy metering tariff, mm -hmm. and replace it with two, right? Customer grid supply, which is essentially NEM at a lesser amount. Mm -hmm. about, about half the amount. About, yeah, yeah, 15 yeah. cents. So mm -hmm. NEM was at retail, which I think at the time was 24 cents. I might be wrong. Mm -hmm. But, um, and the other half of it was customer self-supply, mm -hmm. which is essentially you can build a solar system on your house, but you cannot export energy to the grid. Mm -hmm. And the way that this happens in most residences, because people are at work instead of at home during the day, mm -hmm. is they store that energy in a battery and then mm -hmm. use it at night. So those batteries uh, uh, again, often, again, shaving that peak. Shaving that peak, exactly, <laughs> right? So we have you know the infamous yeah. duck curve, mm -hmm. right? So we have two peaks, one in the morning and one at night. Mm -hmm. And uh, the energy storage, helps to shave that peak by export or by basically lowering the load that the house is putting onto the grid, mm -hmm. right, by using the battery that it's stored up during the day. And so these batteries are often lithium ion, but they can be other things like lead acid or salt water based batteries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now let me give you something, a piece of information that maybe you don't even know and our B this is extra no, this is extra credit for our viewers here. The, as you know, the uh, battery permitting process at the city is pretty gosh darn slow. I, I've heard horror tales of up to six months, and you can correct me, but I think the reason is that the permit checkers just don't really understand this new technology, and they know that they're capable of catching fire, and they are very, 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 very cautious about this. So here's the new piece of information. We, I'm with, I sit on the Hawaii Building Code Council. We pass all the building codes. I'm, I'm the energy code guy. I think I know what you're about to get to. And <laughs> there's, we're, we just, the governor just signed into law the 2014 NEC, National Electrical Code, and we're lagging behind that. That's a whole different story because there is the 2017 National Electrical Code and the last chapter, which is brand new compared to the previous editions of the code, it deals with the uh, battery storage or electrical storage, and it gives the guidelines on how to, and requirements, on how to safely install and operate a battery. So I'm working with uh, Aki, Aki Marceau, at Marceau mm -hmm. and she has come to the council and testified, and the fire, deputy fire chief sits on the council, and he likes her idea, and that is to take that last chapter of 2017, and at the county level, tack it on as a, an amendment. Yeah, so basically wh how I understand it is that mm -hmm. it would reference you know, anything that has to do with uh, the installation of energy storage as it pertains to the National Electric Code, it references the most recent code, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, I mean, so I was gonna say that, uh, first of all, Aki Marceau is great. I think mm -hmm. she's doing a really good job reaching out to try and get that stuff done. And actually, she was one of the people, so you're right, we saw an issue at the Depl Department of Planning and Permitting, the industry did. Mm -hmm. And the issue was that it took forever to get energy storage permits. So oddly, the bottleneck was no longer at HECO. Mm -hmm. It was at the, uh, at least in Oahu, it was at the pr Planning and Permitting Department. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, over many months, uh, we got together with uh, DPP folks. Um, D and DPP, Department of Planning and Permitting. Yes, yeah. sorry, mm -hmm. I need to uh, define my acronyms. Uh, Department of Planning and Permitting folks, um, and they were nice enough to facilitate, a, and they continued to do so, facilitate mm -hmm. some meetings between industry people like myself, um, the Distributed Energy Resources Council, and mm -hmm. Elemental Accelerator, and several other people, and we're working really hard to help them kind of, you know, basically help them figure out what their issues are with energy storage, how we can uh, mm -hmm. assure them that the technology mm -hmm. is safe, mm -hmm. and how we can better integrate it, you know, into their code and into their processes. And those conversations actually have, in the last few months, we've had a pickup in a lot of permits, especially on the residential side. Mm -hmm. And I attribute a lot of that work to, uh, you know, myself and those other folks as well, um, especially Aki, who, who was kind enough to start those meetings up. So I think, you know, it's moving, you know, as all things in Hawaii, sometimes it's slow to get started. Mm -hmm. But once it does, I mean, it, it is getting started. The other thing that we're doing is uh, materials and methods, right? So mm -hmm. basically, uh, the DPP has a, an expedited permitting process for certain 
uh, materials, uh, well, for certain technologies that are vetted by their staff, right? That they didn't, uh, including solar water heating, including yeah. solar water yeah, heating, yeah. right? Or yeah. commercial heaters, all different kinds mm -hmm. of stuff. And so one of the things that the industry did was like, well, we need to provide the DPP with different uh, materials for different battery storage mm -hmm, options mm -hmm. and different uh, loadouts for these options so that they can be comfortable, for, comfortable with them and make an M&M &M mm -hmm, or materials mm -hmm. and methods number that then we can help expedite that process. So they know that their plan checkers, first of all, are not spreading their resources very thin to check a bunch of different mm -hmm, things mm -hmm. because they can look at a whole set of plans now and say, hey, all these plans, they fall under m, &M number. So these are good. We know these are good. Mm -hmm. These other plans, we can be a little bit more, you know, we, can, we can focus a little bit in, take a deeper dive, and see exactly what's going on and feel comfortable with those too. And as we start going through these permits, I think the DPP folks will get more comfortable as they always do. The fire people will as well. It just takes a lot of work. And I think one of the things that the industry didn't realize was that we, you know, we needed to help initiate that work. And mm -hmm. we've done it, and we've got a good working group going. But yeah, you're right. It took a while. But now it's, it's happening. And I attribute a lot of the success to all the people that worked with this, including mm -hmm. the DPP folks. So yeah, what, what, a, what a concept, collaboration. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah right? Mm -hmm. The other thing about the code, I mean, I think that people don't realize right now, I think we're in the 2008. NEC code is what the city and county uses. I think you're right, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it's 2017 here, and mm -hmm, and the mm -hmm. DVP knows this, and they're mm -hmm. like, we need to update this code immediately. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I think, and we're very, from what I know, we're getting very close to updating that code. And yeah. I, you can be sure, rest assured mm -hmm. here, that I'm gonna work to, to push that through and get that code yeah, updated. Yeah, the, the process is that the administration, city administration, proposes the the code as a bill to the city council. Right. City council introduces it, and then there's three hearings. Right. So it'll be very useful for people like yourselves and Aki to appear at those uh, three hearings. Well, I will definitely be there, as well as Leslie Colbrooks at Dirk and, mm -hmm. and Aki as well. Um, and you know, we're working with the DPP folks on this, and and I expect a lot of success. And it just makes sense, right? It just makes sense to have mm -hmm. an updated code. Yeah, um, because it just helps facilitate the build out of renewable energy, which I think mm -hmm. is what we all want, because we have this big mandate of 2045 that we need to get to. Yep. And there's a lot of different pieces that go into that puzzle, mm -hmm. and permitting mm -hmm. is one of them. Absolutely. And oh, let's see, before we get into any more of that, we're just getting warmed up here. We need to take a break. Howard Wig, Think Tech Hawaii. My guest today is Will PC Solar Energy Association and two or three other hats back in a moment. <laughs> this is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science, where we'll dig into science, dig into the meat of science, dig into the joy and delight of science. We'll discover why science is indeed fun, why science is interesting, why people should care about science, and care about the research that's being done out there. It's all great, it's all entertaining, it's all educational, so I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history. Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. Welcome back, Howard Wig, Code Green Think Tech Hawaii. Where there's a will, there's a way, which is why we have Will Gisi, Hawaii Solar Energy Association, and we've been talking about topics that are so exciting we can just barely contain ourselves. <laughs> but we had better move on to the what we see in the future for solar. And this regards Hawaiian Electric, and they are now, I worked for Hawaiian Electric with Hawaiian Electric for probably as long as you've been on the planet, and they have really, really, really changed now. They say in public, we're totally committed to 100% clean energy, and they are walking the talk. Two very important measures that they're talking about, which directly relates to photovoltaic on the roof, 
is DR demand response and TOU time of use. Which one would you like to discuss first and, and describe for our audience? I think uh, let's kind of start with time of use because mm -hmm. I think that's probably the most relevant. And the reason I say that is because in the current uh, distributed energy resources docket, uh, which has to do with obviously distributed energy in Hawaii and integrating it, we're talking about a smart export tariff, which mm -hmm. is kind of a new tariff that will be um, in addition to customer self-supply. Mm. Um, that will be essentially a time of use based tariff in that mm -hmm. you will be allowed to export energy now, at now peak ta time. Tariff means billing. In, yeah, in tariff means system. billing. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> so you'll be paid for the energy that you produce to the grid right, mm -hmm. at a certain rate. And uh, the smart export tariff is basically you will be paid for energy exports at certain times, which happen to be the peak times that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. right? So the duck curve in the morning and at night. And then during the day, you won't export any energy, much like a CSS system. Mm -hmm. But you'll be storing that energy in your batteries, which then you'll then export during the peak times or at night. Mm -hmm. And so this is a time of use based tariff in a way because the amount of money that you're being given for that exported energy is going to be a certain amount that's determined by the PUC, but it's only going to be during peak times. right? Mm -hmm. And so the other thing about time of use, which I tried, but it didn't work out great for me, was the they have a time of use pilot program. Mm -hmm. right? So um, generally in Hawaii, the way time of use is done is it's split into three time periods. There's on peak, uh, mid peak, and off peak. Mm -hmm. right? And you get charged three different rates. So normally, you would get charged just one flat rate yep. for energy use throughout the day. In time of use scheme, you get charged for different time periods when you use energy. So mm -hmm. if I come home at 5 o'clock, kick off my shoes, turn on the TV, I'm getting charged maybe 25 cents, right, mm -hmm. or 30 cents, or some very high tariff. Mm -hmm. But if I'm and working from home in the middle of the day, you know, an off-peak, when there's a lot of solar energy going on and the generators are not, the mm -hmm. utility generators aren't going, I'm getting charged a very small amount for energy, right, during the off-peak time. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of incentivizes certain customer behavior, right? or incentivizes certain behavior by companies to you know, use mm -hmm. energy during the off-peak because it's going to save you money in the long run. I think the problem was that, you know, it's, especially from the resident side, it's not everybody gets to work from home. And a mm -hmm. lot of people just want to come home at 5 o'clock and use energy and turn on the TV and relax and not really think about, hey, how much energy am I using? Mm -hmm. And last I heard, the uh, TOU tariff um, pilot program, which had 5,000 possible slots, had only about 2,500. Mm -hmm. But the nice thing about this is that it kind of sets it up for different things, like especially in, in the realm of PV, right? For smart export, it sets it up for customer-based renewable energy, which has a time of use based tariff as well. Um, and in the future, obviously, things like grid services, or you get paid almost to not generate energy, or you get paid to produce, or you get paid to have a service that you give to the grid that's not just straight energy. So it sets it up for a lot of good things. It's a precedent, right? And so, anyway. Yeah, let, let me just um, try to yeah, I don't accommodate us, us late, late people here. So probably the cheapest rate would be in the middle of the day, starting right. about 10 in the morning when the sun gets really shiny and going till 4, 4.30 in the afternoon when the sun begins to set. The PVs right now are producing more energy than Hawaiian Electric can accommodate. They can throttle down their power plants only so far. Right. They throttle them down anymore and just like a car, it, it's gonna stall. Yeah, you have to have a must run generation. Yeah and the PV actually produces more than that, so there is a certain wastage here. So you want to use as much energy as you possibly can during that time, and they're gonna make it cheap for you. Why not put your dishwasher, clothes washer, and dryer on timers so that they go on at 10, 30, 11, noon? I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't that be an option? I think it's a brilliant idea. Mm -hmm. Also, if you have a solar, if you have a hot water heater that's not solar, you could do this mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Setting everything on timers, I think, is a really, it's a very simple, very low cost way for people to save money, especially mm -hmm. if you're on a time of use tariff. If you're on a flat rate, like a retail rate, there's no incentive for you to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And so, one of the hopes is that these time of use tariffs will incentivize this type of behavior. But I think. There needs to be a really strong effort by the utility as well as other stakeholders to get the word out that, hey, mm -hmm. this tariff exists. 
you need to use this kind of behavior to do it. I think one of those ways, obviously, grid modernization, having people have more access to their data and their usage mm -hmm, data, mm -hmm. what's called usage profiles, right, where you're looking on when do I turn things on during the day, how much energy am I using, mm -hmm. all different kinds of stuff. I think it all incentivizes this type of behavior, but it's hard, right, for people to change their behavior that they've, they've been doing for, I don't know, mm -hmm. yeah, 40, it's 50, just 60 plain years. old habit. It, it, yeah. It's hard to change habits. One uh, option that I see is in the little newsletter that Hawaiian Electric uh, sends out with our bills is a chart. Here's, let's see, here's uh, midnight, your rates are fairly low, and here's 10 o'clock in the morning or whatever, your rate is way down here, and then comes 4.35 in the afternoon, boom, goes up. After 9.30 or so, boom, goes down again. I mean, that's totally visual. Right. And then have clever illustrations. You know, put on your uh, water heater, dishwasher, whatever. Put, set it on timers and put them on this time. You're getting cheap energy. Come on. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the things I'd yeah. like to see is, uh, you know, state programs to incent this type of behavior through technology, right? Because everybody mm -hmm. loves data. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at, I mean, a, if you own a house and you have a simple CT monitoring thing that connects to an online portal that looks mm -hmm. at your energy usage, now you know. Or it connect to like. The Internet of Things, which is kind of a, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a millennial term. Now, as you're, a millennial you're, 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 like. you're talking like a millennial here. Yeah. <laughs> no, not, yeah. not my favorite term, but it is applicable in this point, right? Because then all the things would be connected and you could set one time for all of them, right? Mm -hmm. Theoretically, right? In the future, this would be great. If everybody was kind of reactive to the grid's wants and needs mm -hmm. and we were all players and we all contributed to this, it would be great. And that's something that, you know, I hope as we continue to go into the future and work on all mm -hmm. these dockets, you know, power supply improvement plan just got closed, the grid modernization plan, the final plan was filed, DER continues to go, all these different things. I mean, I'm really mm -hmm. excited for what the future will bring, and I think and it will. Speaking of the future, we have a very, very tiny future in this program left to us, and, you know, we didn't even scratch the surface. so. Let's bring you back in the not distant future. <laughs> I have a whole bunch of other topics. Great. And uh, this is affecting everybody's pocketbook, so they're going to be just fascinated beyond words. Sure. So on that sad note, we must bid fond adieu to Will Gacy, Hawaii Solar Energy Association, and a bunch of other hats talking about a program that is going to affect each and every one of us in the pocketbook. Howard Wig, Code Green, see you next time.